He's a former SIT student, he's an alum, and works for the organization on Dole, with a special emphasis on the Global Partnership for Education. So, here's Tony Baker. Thank you, Sarah. This is the story of two farm boys. Each grew up in rural communities uh, with their parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins, um, with families that were raising cattle in areas surrounded by fields of corn and beans. Uh, the one on the left, that's me in uh, southeast Missouri, Midwest USA. Um, and the other person in the story is Juma from northern Tanzania. Uh, this is not Juma, uh, but it is a boy who kind of reminds me of him. So when I was 22 years old, I was living in a village in northern Tanzania, and um, one day I got a knock on my door, and on the other side was this 10-year-old boy um, that I'd never seen before. And he said that he had seen me earlier in the village center and had followed me home. And, uh, <laughs> and he wasn't only not from the village, but he was actually from an area on the complete other side of the mountain. And he had, the day before, left home, walked 15 miles across the mountain, um, slept up in a tree so as not to be eaten by hyenas, very smart, and um, was now in our village and was continuing on his way to a town called Babati, another 40 miles away from there. Uh, why? Because he wanted to go to school. Uh, he was actually from uh, not only just another part of, of the district, but from another tribe, the Barbag, that are semi-nomadic pastoralists. Um, and his parents, like many of the parents in that community, uh, don't send their kids to school. It, it does, it's not conducive to their semi-nomadic lifestyle. Um, the quality of education and, and hasn't really been built and isn't really, hasn't been adapted to meet the needs of that community. They're not really seeing the value of education, and it's not really benefiting uh, their, their way of life. So, um, he was, what he had heard is that he has an uh, uncle in this town called Babati, and uh, he had left home to go, uh, hopefully stay with his uncle and go to school. Um, already at this young age of 10, he had identified that education was his, his own path and what would lead him to a future that, that he would want, and he was braving everything to do that. He had left home. He was traveling through the wilderness, uh, and um, all on the, the gamble that his uncle will receive him uh, so that he can go to school. So, and, and he was hungry. He stopped by my place, uh, hoping to at least uh, get some food. It was about lunchtime. I had a couple of ears of corn on the fire inside. I went in, grabbed one, gave it to him. And uh, in a gesture that is just epitomizes the limitless hospitality that you'll find all over Tanzania. Uh, he immediately snapped the ear of corn in two and gave me half, despite what you would know is his own incredible hunger. Uh, I assured him that I had another inside, and we talked a bit more, and uh, before he left, we went down to the field and grabbed a few more fresh ears for his journey, and he was on his way. Most of my career, I, I've spent trying to turn stacks of, of national budget books and uh, gigantic spreadsheets upon spreadsheets of bilateral and multilateral aid um, into, into this, kids enjoying their rights to education, kids like Juma. And, but this story actually has a second beginning right here in Vermont within SIT, with the education that I got here, as well as the experience that I got from working with the community uh, in this area. This is a tool developed by uh, SIT professor Jeff Unsicker, um, and it's an advocacy planning tool. Um, it's, it's 
something that you can see here that is kind of a road map to, you know, you know you have this problem, and how do you get to the solution and who has the power to, to implement that solution. And something running from identifying the problem to the cause of that, to the solution, to the policy objective of that solution, the message, all of these activities that will carry the message, and then how it gets your tar to your targets either directly or through the media or sometimes through the public. Uh, it's something that I took and literally started using in Tanzania. And when I said literally, I meant literally. Working with people, teaching them just taking like exactly what I had learned <laughs> at SIT and planting it down in Tanzania with young advocacy groups that were starting up and advocacy is a is a murky field. You start and you really don't know um, what the next steps are. So providing a roadmap like that is uh, was instrumental. Also, with my time here, uh, I was uh, working with some issues around Vermont Yankee. Uh, at my time, this was in uh, 2008, uh, and it long preceded me and it continues on, but there was a large citizen campaign to decommission a nuclear power plant uh, in the southern part of the state that was uh, old and overstrained and uh, somewhat mismanaged, and, and on a bad day looked like this. Coolant towers collapsed, leaking, uh, fire in the control room. Uh, so it's no wonder that people were really concerned and trying to take action on this uh, as it poses an obvious threat to not only Vermont but the entire New England area. And with that concern, people found out that they weren't the only ones and quickly identified others all over the state that had the same worries that they did. And they came together in a really coordinated strategy that hinged on the power of the state legislature to, to um, shut down the nuclear plant. And something where they strategically identified who was involved in this coalition, and because it's ultimately on the state legislature, they knew that they would have to be in act active in areas all across the state for this to work. And it worked. This, this uh, long uh, campaign led by city, citizens with a strategy that really balanced the scales of a David and Goliath story that turned you know, from local citizens that were going up against an out-of-state, multi-billion dollar energy corporation uh, that turned into a success story as the Senate, uh, the state legislature passed landmark uh, vote to be the first state in history to uh, close a nuclear power plant. These types of lessons, again, just stayed with me as I went back to Tanzania. So I had been in Tanzania, I, then I came to SIT in Vermont, and then I went back to continue work there. While I was there, the second time I was with an organization, a domestic civil society group called Hakialingu, which is Swahili wordplay on the right to education, literally. And uh, Hakialingu really got its, its, found its home in education because on top of the issues of health, security, economic growth, all of the benefits we know of education, they view the education as the only foundation for long-lasting development, uh, that only through an educated and active citizenry can you build your nation, hold your government accountable to really reach true prosperity. And education was their entry point. Issues at that time, and in many ways still the same, were around construction of classrooms, teacher houses, <coughs> learning materials, desks, getting books into classrooms, getting well-trained teachers into classrooms. 
And one of the ways that we were doing this was through a type of research uh, called Public Expenditure Tracking Surveys, PETS. Kind of a strange acronym, but that's what it is. And we were going to, uh, to, from the central government to the school level and tracking, just following the money at every stage along the way. Um, and from the central level to the regional, to the district, finally to the school, and you discover what are politely called leakages at almost every, every step of that until sometimes what the school receives is so much less than what was intended and it's no wonder that we're not seeing the, the results expected. But that type of research is very useful, it's very diagnostic, but it's difficult whenever you're, it's revealing systemic issues. And we weren't the only ones doing this type of research. We got together with a lot of organizations that were working in def different sectors and came together and found out that if we sit down, very reminiscent of the Vermont Yankee work, and we started looking at where we were operating and the types of issues that we were finding, soon enough we'd have a, somewhat of a complete picture to really drive and, and use this localized research to, to inform uh, national change. Sometimes it wasn't about leakages, but just that the, there's no budget for it. Uh, with Tanzania, there was a largely World Bank funded program called the Primary Education Development Program that really allowed Tanzania to abolish school fees for primary school and build the classrooms to absorb the, the increased enrollment. That first five years of that program went through very effectively. The second five years was meant uh, to be taken up by the government, and it didn't really happen. You had development budgets that uh, we were finding to be 4% of the, what was meant to be the budget. Just the money's not there. We were walking into schools that, and going through their, their bank statements month after month, three years back, 36 months back, and seeing that this minimal balance in their development account uh, hadn't received a single cent in those three years. It resulted in things like this, like uh, in this village, classrooms sitting there incomplete for five years until a local organization got together and mobilized the funds to finally finish the work that had begun. Now, I've returned, I'm based in DC, and I'm with an organization called Results Educational Fund. Results is a grassroots civil society organization that, whose mission is to create the political will to end poverty. Uh, we work with a network of active citizens across the US who, in turn, work with their local media, work with their members of Congress, to address a lot of the issues that we're talking about and to mobilize the political will and support uh, for us to take our role in that. One of the things that we pay a lot of attention to is uh, kind of a, a new kid on the block, uh, the Global Partnership for Education. Uh, they're actually older than 10 years now, but they rebranded and relaunched a couple of years ago. Uh, this is a multilateral organization um, and really, it's about the, the best place to put one's money, in, in my opinion. Um, they bring together donors, developing country governments, uh, non-governmental organizations, private sector, and uh, to really pull as much resources as they can. At the country level, they do a little bit of the same with these things called local education groups. Uh, that are, again, governments, NGOs, private sector, civil society, that all sit at the table and develop a national education plan. And that is what GPE supports, is that national education plan. It's a way to support the government in a uh, systems-based manner to really help them do the job that they're meant to do, which is uphold these, these services. <coughs> So here, based in the U.S., we do a lot of, of close monitoring of the U.S.'s role in the Global Partnership for Education. And in 2011, GPE had a pledging conference in which it was uh, raising the money for their work for the next three years. This is the results of that 2011 pledging conference. Um, you'll see the 
UK at the top with 403 million that they gave through a multi-year pledge, and we rang in at about 22 million. Uh, that's 5% of, of the leading donor uh, to, to this mechanism. Um, even countries like, uh, that have much lower GDPs like Denmark and Netherlands uh, contributed so much more than that, um, like 10 times the amount that, that we did. To put that a little bit in perspective, every million dollars that uh, is implemented by GPE gets 10,000 kids, like 10,000 Jumas, into the classroom. We also work a lot with the World Bank. Uh, we just can't ignore the World Bank. The bank is the planet's largest external financier of education. Uh, and what we look at most closely is the International Development Association, IDA, which is the bank's, quote, fund for the poorest. Uh, it is, it's the arm of the bank that provides low or no interest loans and grants to the world's poorest countries. It's the arm that really, that paid for Tanzania's uh, first phase of its primary education development program that really revolutionized education uh, in Tanzania. And in those terms, we look at support to basic education that they're providing. One of the, the key issues on this is around a pledge that the World Bank made in 2010 to increase the, its support <laughs> to basic education. Um, this, this is a kind of historic chart starting at 2,000 years on the bottom, millions of dollars on the going up and down of, of IDA support to basic education. And this is what it looked like before 2010. At this point, they entered in and, and had a pledge that said, we're going to do two things. We're going to increase uh, our lending by $750 million, and that this increase would represent a 40% total increase of, of our support. There's a lot of celebration around that. It put it a, 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 um, right here, this kind of pledge line that we would expect to see uh, the bank to provide that support. A year later, we found out that um, there's been some more discussions internally on uh, what the bank had set as the baseline for that pledge. So what would be the bottom and then what that would be the uh, additional $750 million on top of. And amazingly, it put the pledge target here. And that's because the baseline wasn't at 2010, but they said the average of everything going back to 2011 that will be the baseline that we'll add the 750 on to. Uh, so of course these lower years in the beginning pulled down that average and your pledge really became meaningless. Um, that, that's basically like your boss telling you you're going to get a raise and you go home and celebrate and you come back the next day and your boss says, wait, you're, you thought that you meant on top of your existing salary? No, I meant your salary from 10 years ago. That's what I'm, and actually effectively it's a pay cut, not a raise, but we're still calling it a raise. So that, that's really, and we've been engaging them for 18 months on that and put out a lot of campaigning that got the president, Jim Kent, got the president of the World Bank, got his attention. Um, but unfortunately, it's still been a, a tug of war. Last week at the UN uh, General Assembly meetings uh, in New York, Jim Kim, president of the World Bank, made this announcement. Almost three years ago, the bank group pledged to increase IDA financing for basic education by an additional $750 million over five years to help countries reach the Education Millennium Development Goals. I'm proud to report that we exceeded that financing target a full two years ahead of schedule. What does it actually look like? We've been warning the bank that the way that they're tracking this pledge could actually amount in a decrease in support while claiming an increase. Now they've claimed that increase, what does it actually look like? Here's that same information from the previous chart in three year intervals. Here's the pledge, and here's what they've done since the pledge has been made. It's an 8% de decrease, $270 million less. Uh, and mind you that the actual blood target should be up here somewhere. So, and again, 271 million, 
That, that bank program that I talked about in Tanzania, that one the World Bank put in 150 million to put some perspective on, on what that kind of money can do. It can revolutionize uh, countries' education systems. Sometimes these kind of aggregate figures can mask other things within that. So uh, maybe one can say, well, maybe there's been great increases in priority areas, but the overall is still lower. Here's Sub-Saharan Africa over the same time frame. No increase, it's just been flat. Those GPE countries, by, by definition, those that are members of GPE, um, are those that are working hardest to uh, reform and improve their education systems and merit more support. Support from the World Bank has just been decreasing for the majority of them. Conflict affected and fragile states, again, um, critical areas, have experienced a rise and fall, if anything, since the, the bank has made that pledge. So, I was in the room whenever Jim Kim made that announcement, and my stomach just sank. Not only because this, I know this, but because I know I'm probably one of a, a few people outside the World Bank that know this. And that, that can get really difficult, and um, that's a real challenge, that's a real struggle, and I, I felt really alone. Um, and, but then I try to remember what I learned at SIT, the kind of cam campaigns that I saw in Vermont, the kinds of things that I saw in Tanzania, and I remember that I'm not alone in this. I'm part of this, that we have people all over the U.S. that are working hard on these same issues, uh, and beyond us, there's not just that, but we have friends in Canada, Mexico, UK, Australia, and Japan uh, that are all working on, on these types of things. The challenge is huge, but the game is really changing. Uh, we're just, we're getting faster, we're getting more informed, we're getting farther reaching. And all of that, you know, I think the day will come where uh, the if you look at this map and think about that coverage, uh, I really believe that the story is so changing so much that it's not only going to be about getting kids like Juma, uh, upholding their right to education, helping them getting into school, but as this movement proceeds, they're going to be very well involved and part of the movement and upholding their rights, all of us as a collective. Thank you. Thank you.